Okay. We are recording now. Okay, hypothesis uh, testing. I did email you this handout last night, guys. If you have a printout, that would be very useful. If not, it just please pay attention to my screen and I will share this completed handout. But it's a long one, it's 10 pages, so I won't share it until I'm done with all the section of this chapter. What is a hypothesis test? It's a process that uses information from a sample to test a claim about a population parameter. The three population parameters that we'll be testing in chapter seven is testing the mean, testing the population proportion as you did in chapter six, and testing the standard deviation, the population standard deviation. In reality, guys, we don't know what the population mean is. We don't know what the population proportion, for example, if I ask you, do you know the percent of people who drink coffee in the United States? You cannot tell me that we know that because in order to know, you have to ask every single one in the United States whether you drink coffee or not and then find the proportion. If let's say 70 million out of 325 million say they drink coffee, then you say it's 70 over 325. But we don't know that and we cannot do it because it does cost so much money to survey every single person in the United States and it does take so much time. It might take years, you know, to get a project like that done. So we, uh, so we don't know what the population proportion in general, we don't know what the population mean is we need, we, but we can test them. We can make claims about them and test validate those claims or probably not validate the claims. Here is an example of a hypothesis test, guys. An automobile manufacturer advertises that it's a new hybrid car has a mean mileage of 50 miles per gallon. So they claim that if you buy their car, you can do a 50 miles per gallon. Well, you wanna test this claim. So you collect a sample of cars. Let's say you collect, you collect a sample of information from 15 cars of the same you know, make and model, and you see what the mileage on the, the, the per gallon is on these cars. If your information reveals a sample mean that is very different from the advertised mean, so probably you can conclude that the automobile manufacturer advertisement is false. For example, you collect you know, data from seven other cars and you come up with this sample mean, 33.5 miles per gallon. Well, 33.5 guys is too far from 50. So probably the manufacturer advertisement is false, but you still have to go through steps and process and procedures, you know, to conclude that. But if you come up with this, 53.5 miles per gallon, that's on average, probably that will prompt you to say, probably the manufacturer claim is true because 53.5 is close to 50. But if it is too far from 50, let's say you get 23.5, 23.7, whatever, that's too far. So probably you're gonna end up saying that the advertisement is false. In general, guys, we don't know what the true value of the population parameters are. So we estimate them. And that's why we do a hypothesis test. So what is an hypothesis, a statistical hypothesis? It's a statement or a claim about a population parameter, we state a pair of hypotheses, one that represents a claim and the other one that represents the total opposite of the claim. So when you do a hypothesis test, guys, in any research study, they have to come up with two hypotheses, one that has the claim in it and the other one that's the total opposite, you know, just of the claim. The first one, guys, is called the null hypothesis. And the second one is called the alternative hypothesis. We will define what each one is. So guys, if I tell you one hypothesis, it's raining today, what do you think the alternative hypothesis will be? Can someone comment? It has to be the total opposite, guys. Not raining, exactly. So if I tell you X, the mean is five, what would be the alternative? 
mean, I claim that the mean, the average is five. Negative five? No, it's op. Oh, what I meant by opposite, I want you know just that, not opposite in signs, opposite statement. So what would be the negation of this one? Complement, not five. So is the opposite of that is is not five exactly, but not negative signs. No, we. So uh, if I say. More than 15% of my students will get an A in my class. What would be the alternative statement? 15 students will not get an A. Okay, well, more than 15. What would be the complement of more than 15? Less, and then there's something else that I, less than or equal to, because I didn't include the equal and more, it will be in the alternative. We will get into those. So this is what I mean by alternative statements. Let me tell you what the null hypothesis is. The null hypothesis, guys, is a statistical hypothesis that contains a statement of equality such that, so your null hypothesis can have only one of those signs and don't mistake it with the alternative. This is what the null hypothesis can have. It can have this sign, that one, or this one only. No other signs can be in the null. Now, why they call it a statement of equality? Maybe you're wondering, why do we call this a statement of equality? Because it has an equal sign. It's less than or equal. Equal, greater than or equal. As you may notice, guys, I say the word equal in all three. The notation for the null hypothesis is this, H with an O at the bottom with a zero. It is called H sub, sub zero or H naught. The null hypothesis denoted HO after represents status quo, previous belief, the facts that we already have and trying to make a claim against them. This is what HO is. The null hypothesis contains the signs, let me put them one more time, equal, less than or equal to or greater than. Alternative hypothesis, guys. It is a statement of inequality. It has to have one of those. This, this, or that. This statement must be true if the null hypothesis is false. And let me tell you why this, what I'm saying is valid. If I tell you that the statement it is raining today is false, so then definitely, guys, you can conclude that it is not raining. So the opposite will be true. So if one statement is false, the total complement of it should be true. This statement must be true if HO is false. It is denoted by HA and read H sub A. The hypothesis is assumed to be true when the null hypothesis is false. Both the null and the alternative hypothesis should, should be stated in any hypothesis test, guys. You have to state HO and HA. So if you make a claim, guys, about something, you have to state another statement that is opposite to your claim. So if someone wants to argue with you, they will try to argue that the other statement is correct if they believe that you are wrong. So you have to give them a chance, you know, to argue. And that's how hypothesis testing works. In other words, you technically are not supposed to do a data analysis and decide on the hypothesis later. You have to state your hypothesis to begin with and then fight for the one that you believe it is strong and you want to support. Collect enough evidence you know, for the one that you believe it is true and try to defend it. And this is similar, guys, to the uh, court system. If a person is being tried for a crime or something for wrongdoing, uh, the court will make, will assume two statements. It's not one, only one statement. There are two statements in the court before the jury. The first statement is the defendant is not guilty. And the second statement is the defendant is guilty. The defendant is not guilty. This is what the attorney for the defendant will try, you know, to support because he's going to fight, you know, just for his client. But the prosecutor 
will try to collect enough evidence to support the statement that the defendant is guilty. Who wins? Do you guys know who wins in the court case? Which one wins? The one who, what? How do they reach a verdict? Does anyone uh, know uh, uh, based on what they reach a verdict, you know, just in the... Uh, Isn't it the jury selection? Yeah, but based on what? Collecting enough evidence beyond what? Do you know the word? Doubt. Exactly, and this is how it's gonna work in hypothesis testing. The one who can collect enough evidence beyond reasonable doubt to prove his or her case win the argument. And this is exactly how it's gonna work in hypothesis testing. If the jury decide there is enough evidence to convict the person, then the person will be declared, you know, defendant will be declared guilty. If the jury says we don't have enough evidence beyond, there are, there are not, they were not, the prosecutor was not able to collect enough evidence beyond reasonable doubt to convict the person, then they would declare, acquit the person, declare that the person is not guilty. And it's, it's going to work the same way in hypothesis testing. You will see that later, guys. The major purpose of hypothesis testing is to choose between two competing hypotheses about the value of a parameter. For example, one hypothesis must be the claim that the wages of men and women are equal. Another one could be that, uh, that men make more than women or women make more than men or the men and women have different wages. So these are two competing hypotheses. The hypothesis actually to be tested is usually given the sample, a simple HO. This is the null hypothesis and commonly referred to as a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is assumed to be true unless there is strong evidence against it. So guys, when we state the null and the alternative hypothesis, we have to assume that the null hypothesis is true to begin with, it's just like in the court system. The court, the jury, everybody assume that the defendant is not guilty to begin with, and then they'll wait, you know, just for whomever is gonna collect, you know, enough evidence against this or that. Same thing in uh, hypothesis testing. We assume HO is true until proven otherwise. Now, if it's not true, guys, you're gonna find evidence against it. No worry at all. It's not like you're making a wrong assumption here. You're making an assumption. It is true until you find something against it. Let me give you an example in mathematics. Let's say I assume that X equals five. I don't know, so I'll make an assumption. Let's say X equals five, and let's see if this is true. And then I do some work, and at the very end, I got this statement, four equals seven. Is four equals seven, guys, a true statement? No, it's not a true statement. That tells me that my assumption that I built everything on was wrong because I ended up with four equals seven. I ended with a contradiction. And you're gonna feel the same way with hypothesis testing. We will reject HO and support HA if the data provide enough evidence against HO. So if HO is bad, that means HA is good. If HO is not bad, that means HA is not good. That's how hypothesis testing is gonna work. How do we measure the evidence and how do we collect the evidence? It's by the sample. We collect data from the sample. We find X bar, the mean, we get the standard deviation, we get the sample size, etc. And those are all gonna be summarized under something called test statistic. You already are familiar with Z, which you learned how to change, you know, X bar to a Z score. So this is what we're talking about here. Let's move to the next part. We'll do lots of examples, guys, on stating the null and the alternative hypothesis. So, no worry, you're going to get to work with this today. Okay. Uh, I'll get to this later, but I want to show you how to write the null and the alternative hypothesis. As I told you guys, hypothesis testing is five steps. Today, you're gonna walk out feeling very strong about step number one, because we're gonna do quite a bit of exercising, exercises doing step number one. 
which is critical because if you cannot state your claim correctly and you state your claim incorrectly, you will be defending something that's not even your claim. And this is really bad. So we're going to learn how to state the null and the alternative hypothesis. To write the null and the alternative hypothesis, translate the claim to a mathematical statement and then write its complement. There will be three possible statements. As I told you, HO contain. Let's say I make up this. If this is equal, can you guys tell me what's going to be in the alternative? Not equal. Not equal. Good enough. If this is less than or equal to, what do you guys think it's going to be in the alternative? More than or equal to? No, no equal, because if you have equal on one side, you cannot have it on the other side. So just more. And the third one, guys, is greater than or equal to. What do you think the alternative is going to be? OK, I'll read the chat. Less than, I agree. Okay, how do you state the null and the alternative? You see HO, guys, and there is a column. You have to put a column. Then you write the parameter that you are testing. We are in the entire remaining time of the semester, guys. We're testing three parameters, either the mean or the proportion or the standard deviation, but mostly mean and proportion P. So no other parameters. So if he's asking us to test mean equals 15, then this one not equal 15. Let me just put 15 for all of them. I'm just making up this number. So you guys, the equal and not equal come together always. These two come together. So if you ask me how many choices do you have to state the null and the alternative, you only have three choices. It's one of those three. Don't mix them up, guys. HO must have one of those, and HA must have one of those. Let's do some practice. Express the following statements using algebraic expressions, equations, or inequalities. Use mu for mean, sigma for standard deviation, p for proportion. Then write another statement that is opposite or complement to the original. Remember, what I mean by opposite, not the negative sign. It's just a total complement of it. Okay, mean ID score is less than 120. So mean, you start with this simple. For mean, we use this. For proportion, we use P. And for standard deviation, we use sigma, population. So less than 120 is this one. Can you guys tell me what the complement is? What's the complement going to be? Can I have some input from someone? Uh, no, I got the greater than. And I got greater than or equal to. So greater than or equal to. Yes. Because look, guys, this is less than. It's right here. The other one has to be greater than or equal to. No choice. A greater, but it happened that we put the alternative first. It's OK. It's just asking us to write the statement, and it's opposite. We usually put HO first, but here HO ended up being next. But we will write HO always first. OK, what about the second one? Transportation company claims that the mean waited time for pickup is less than 15 minutes. So I'll put this. That shouldn't be hard now. Would you guys agree with me if I do the same exactly as we did before? This has happened to be the null, and this has happened to be the alternative. OK, what about number three? Standard deviation of test score is no more than 4.5. Take a few seconds, guys. Write it down. No more. What's the simple for no more than? Uh, no, it says no more. 
I had a student says greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, exactly. Okay, what would be the opposite? There you go, guys. You can read it from here. If you have a less than, the opposite has to be greater than. You can memorize those two uh, pair, three pairs, guys. They have to be always together. A school administrator claims that the proportion of students who score 1,300 or more on the set is 55%. Come on, guys, give me your input. It's a P, proportion. What would it be? He claims that the proportion of students who get 1,300 or more is 55%. What does is stand for? Equal to? Yes. Don't be afraid of saying that, 55%. And what would be the alternative? Not equal to. And you tell me, if you tell me, uh, why did you put not equal, guys? Let me show you again. Equal comes with not equal. Less than or equal to comes with greater. Greater than or equal to comes with less. You cannot change those facts. The mean cost of a new computer is more than 1,200. So that's the alternative. What would be the complement, guys? It will be less than or equal to, yes. This happened to be, guys, the null, and this is the alternative. Sometimes the claim can be in the alternative. Sometimes the claim can be in the null. But most of the time, the claim is in the alternative. It should be in the alternative hypothesis. The engineer made a hypothesis that the mean parental hardness of all such ductile iron piece is greater than 170. So the mean greater than 170. What would be the complement? Less than or equal to. You got it. This is just a practice, guys, for you. If you hear one statement, how do you think about the opposite statement right away? That's my idea for this practice right here. A manufacturer claims that the thickness of the spearmint gum it produces is 7.5 one hundredth of an inch. Is, look, this is the clue, guys. Is. 7.5. Then the alternative should be easy. Not equal to. So again, guys, before I flip the page, equal comes with this. Less than or equal comes with that. That one comes with this. Anywhere you go, this is going to be the case. Cannot to change those facts. Those three. Try to memorize them. This can be read as equal, is, are. This one is at most, less than or equal to. This one you read it as at least, greater than or equal to. This is more than, less than, not equal to. Let me proceed to the next page. I got quite a bit of those here. The proportion of flights that are delayed does not exceed 15%. So you guys, if you put the mean here, simple, that's wrong because he says proportion. So you have to put P here. Okay, I'll give you a few seconds to... Uh... So does not exceed, that means it's 15% or less. That does not exceed this. So you guys know the opposite, it's gonna be more than 15%. I hope this is helping just for, it's just simple mathematics inequalities here, guys. We claim that the mean nightly hotel price for hotels in South Carolina is no more than $65. So it's mean. And what do you guys think no more is? Less than or equal to? You got it.
and the complement will be greater than 65. Again, guys, you might think he's repeating this too much. The equal gotta be with this. These are the friends. Well, actually, they're not friends here. Less than or equal gotta be with greater than. These are the competing hypotheses. There you go. Never, if you put equal, you must have this. If you put less than or equal in the first one, you must have a greater than in the second and so on and so forth. Practice two. You're gonna write HO, HA, and uh, put a label where the claim is. Is it in the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis? A school publicizes that the proportion of its students who are involved in at least one extracurricular activities is 61%. So would you guys agree with me if I put P here? Okay, can you tell me what do I put? Equal. Equal, yes, is. And you guys, if you just were listening to me, the equal has to become not equal here. And now where is the claim, guys? In the null hypothesis or in the alternative? What did he say? Publicizes, that's the school, publicizes. The school is making the claim that the proportion of students who do extracurricular activities is 61%. So would you guys agree that the claim is in the null? Yes, Julia. Exactly. Two, a car dealership announces that the mean time for an oil change is less than 15 minutes. Okay, to take a few seconds, guys, write them down. Okay, uh, because I put HOHA doesn't mean, guys, that you have to write HO first. Whatever he gives you, what he gives you could be, could fall in the null, could fall in the alternative. He says that the mean time for oil change is less than 15 minutes. Do you guys agree with me that less means this sign? And this sign cannot yeah. be in the null. That cannot be in the null. So it's not because you read it and you have HO ready first for you that you have to write this in HO. No, it has to go to the alternative. Now, once you pick up one hypothesis, you guys, it's easy for you to figure out what the other one is. So what would be the other one, guys? Greater than or equal to? You got it. And your claim now happened to be in the alternative. You can never see a claim by a car dealership that the mean time of an oil change is more than 15 minutes. Nobody will go there if they make this claim because they're telling you that you are expected to wait more than 15 minutes. So they do the less than because that's what attracts people. Number three. Census Bureau data shows that the mean household income in the area served by a shopping mall is 72,500 per year. So this is from the census. A market research firm questions 100 shoppers at the mall to find out whether the mean household income of mall shoppers is higher than that of the general population. I would like you to state HO and HA. Mean, mean, okay. They want to check if the mean household is higher than that of the general population, which we know it's 72,500. What does the word higher means, guys? Greater than. Greater than 72,000. You see, I put the alternative first because he put the claim in the alternative. And the other one will be the complement. Last year, 
a company, your company service technician took an average of eight, 1.8 hours to respond to trouble calls from business customers who had purchased service contracts. Now, the one who's making the claim is asking this question. Do this year's data show a different average response time? It's average, again, mean. Okay, what do you guys think? What are we gonna put? Do this year's data show a different average response time from last year? So what would the- Not uh, equal to? Not equal to, and you got the magic number 1.8. It's against 1.8. So this one must be 1.8, and your claim, guys, is in there. Now maybe a students will ask me, why did I put the claim here, not there? because they say it has an average of a, it's whom, who's making the claim. Just follow the person who's making the claim. He, they, he, he is asking, is it different? So that's why I have to put it in the different from. A manufacturer of tires claims that less than 3% of their tires are defective. Okay, guys, that's H-O. By the way, if you go on YouTube, you want to Google, you know, just uh, view videos on hypothesis testing. Uh, some books, instead of HA, they use it H1 because this is zero. They call the HA H1. It's the same thing, but different label. Okay, this is a percent, guys. It can't be a mean anymore, so it's a proportion. PP. And what goes, uh, what do I write first? You agree? Here, less than 3%. Now, if you ask me why didn't I put less than 3% here, because HO cannot take a less than sign. HO only can take one of those signs. Don't give HO other signs other than those three. So if this is a less, guys, and this is the claim, it's always to have the claim in the alternative hypothesis. The alternative to this sign will be that one. There you go. Any questions? I have a quick question. Yes, go ahead. Um, when are you going to, are we, I mean, I'm sorry, when are you going to post the homework chapter seven? Right after I hang up with you today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I will uh, have the chapter. I thought I made it, uh, I activated that last night, so probably I did it. I will just write once we uh, done with the session, I will activate it. And that should be available throughout this week and probably also through a few days of next week as well. Uh, six. And it is, uh, guys, just the chapter seven homework. Uh, and uh, as you notice, it was available by sections, but I decided it probably will make you focus a little bit more if I just do one homework set for each chapter. And that's why I decided uh, to uh, remove, you know, the sections and just put one homework for the whole thing. Someone in the chat asked if you could go over number four again. Oh, number four. No problem. I think I can. There you go. Okay. The, the belief is the technicians will take an average of 1.8 hours to respond to trouble calls. That's what we know. Somebody is asking a question. Do this year's data show a different average? Different from what? From last year. And what was last year is 1.8. So we need to check if the average is different from 1.8. And this is why I put the mean is not equal to 1.8. And that's the claim. And then the alternative, guys, to not equal to will be an equal to. So a different from, just keep that in your mind. It's always not equal, right? Let's continue. A senator running for office, again, claims that the, he has majority of voters. Let's see if one of you can pick this up.
what would that be, guys? Could we do 50%, like more than 50%? Yes, yes. Majority is more than 50%, but what would be, uh, what would be the parameter here? Not the mean. It would be P. P, exactly. More than 50%, I agree. Majority means, guys, is a little bit more than 50%, even 50.1%, that's majority. Some students would like to put a half there, that's fine, because 50% is one half. Very good. So now, guys, you understand what the word majority. Majority means more than 50%. And if you like me to add something, minority, if you see that in a problem, it's less than 50%. Uh, seven, the standard deviation of waiting time at a restaurant is, is 12 minutes. Let's see what we have here. Equal to, but it's sigma because the standard deviation equals 12 minutes. That's the claim. And then sigma not equal to 12 minutes. All right. Here's how, so this is step number one, guys. Uh, I'm gonna do some, well, actually, let me show you. I included this as well. What I like you to do, guys, for tomorrow, just this the first thing I would start my lesson with. Uh, try to state the null and the alternative hypotheses in one, two, three, four, five, and then we'll go over the answers uh, tomorrow. That was the second handout attached to the email. I will make them available under uh, resources by your instructor as well. So this is, will be your practice. It's not graded uh, for tomorrow. So that I'll spend the first five minutes tomorrow going over this. Just want to make sure that you understand how to state the null and the alternative hypothesis. No matter which hypothesis represent the claim, you always guys have to start with this assumption. We assume the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. We assume that the defendant is not guilty until we collect enough evidence beyond reasonable doubt to convict that person. It works the same way. At the end of the test, this is step number four that you're gonna learn probably tomorrow. You make one of two decisions, guys. Hypothesis testing requires that you make one of two decisions. You reject HO or fail to reject HO. What does this mean to us? In this example, guys, if we end up rejecting in number seven, if we end up rejecting HO, that means HA is good. That means sigma is not equal to 12. Here, if we end up rejecting HO here, we're saying HO is bad. That means HA must be good. That means, yes, the claim of the senator makes sense. The proportion is more than 50%. But if you don't reject HO, you cannot support HA. So in order to support the alternative hypothesis, you must reject one. It's either, if I ask you what color, let's say you have a black and white. If you tell me it's not white, that means it is black. And if you tell me it is white, that means it's not the black. It's one or the other. So if this is good, the second one is bad. If the first one is bad, the second one is good. And we will learn, you know, just how to deal with this. Now, because our decisions are based on a sample, guys, there is a chance of making a mistake. And there are two types of making mistakes when it comes to making a decision about a hypothesis test. I'm gonna write down the type one error, tell you what this one is, and type two error, and tell you what this one is. A type one error occurs when you reject the null hypothesis 
when it is actually true. Do you guys agree that this is a wrong decision when you reject something that is true? Like you make an argument with me, you tell me two plus two, I think it is four and I tell you no. That means I am rejecting something that is true. This is called type one error. It does happen in statistics. Now let me tell you what type two error is. When you fail to reject HO when it is in, when it is false. Let me give you a simple example. You tell me two plus two equals five and I don't reject that. Well, we know two plus two is not five, but I fail to reject your argument. That means I fail to reject it something that is false. That is a mistake, guys. So there are two types of errors in statistics when it comes to making decision, type one error and type two error. Statisticians try to minimize both errors, but the problem is if you try to minimize the first one, the other one, you know, just goes up and vice versa. So you have to find an optimal way, you know, just to minimize both of them. Okay. Let me give you an example of the seriousness of the type one and type two error. But before I do that, I want to fill in this, the blanks with you. If HO is true, guys, and I don't reject it, did I, add, did I do something good? Yes or no? So HO is true, I do not reject it. What do you guys think? Is this a correct decision? Let me see what we have here. Yes, indeed, correct decision. Okay, let's go here now. This and that. HO is true, but you rejected. What do you guys think we did here? We committed something here. Type one, Type one very good. Someone is listening to me. Okay, let's go to the second one. HO is false and you don't reject it. That's bad, guys. This is false and you fail to reject it. What did you commit here? Type two. Type two. You see, there is a chance of making a wrong decision in statistics because your data is based not on the population, it's based on a sample. So there is a chance, but we minimize, we try to minimize this chance. What about if HO is false, guys, and you reject HO? We're saying HO is false and you reject it. What did you do here? Correct decision, excellent. All right, let's do this example. That's an interesting example that I did with the other group earlier. And uh, I wanna show you the seriousness of making those mistakes. They do happen. The USDA limit for salmonella contamination for chicken is 20%. So a meat inspector reports that the chicken produced by a company exceeds the USDA limit. So the claim from the meat inspector that this company that make the chicken produce the chicken, they exceed the USDA limit. So if I state HO and HA first, do you guys know what exceed means in mathematics? It's a proportion here because it says 20%. Do you guys agree with me that exceed means more than 20%? Yes. All right. That's what the inspectors claim. Then the other, the complement will be less than or equal to 20%. You see, they're totally opposite claims. This is, you're saying that your meat is contaminated. This one is saying that your meat is not contaminated. It has 20% or less. See how the hypothesis compete. When will type one and type two error occur? Which one is more serious? And I didn't 
make this up, guys. I just got it from United States Department of Agriculture. That's the source of the example. Can you state the type one error? What is the type one error? Let me define it again. It's when you reject HO when it is actually true. So in the context of this situation, what do you think type one error is? When you what? Reject HO when it is in fact true. So it means that the contamination is less than 20% or equal, uh, equal or less than 20%, but you end up rejecting this one. So let me write it down. Actually, contamination is less than or equal to 20% but the inspector fails to acknowledge that. To acknowledge this fact. So you're telling that the meat producer that your contamination is more than 20% when it is actually less than 20%. So you're, you're making false accusation. That's what the type one error here. Type two error, what do you guys think the type two error is? When you fail to reject HO when it is false. So we know HO is false, but we fail to reject this one. That means contamination is more than 20% because this is false, guys. but the inspector fails to acknowledge that. Which one is more serious in your opinion, guys? To make a type one error here, if you were the inspector, which type uh, of error would you be able to live with if you made unintentionally, definitely, not intentionally, uh, type one or type two, what are the consequences of making each type of error? Yes? So, so you can live, so Allah, you said you can live with type two, not type one, making type two error. Which one is more serious? Type two? Okay, do you guys know what uh, type two uh, is more serious? Because contamination is more than 20%, but the inspector is saying no, it's less than or equal 20%. You know what's gonna happen? They're gonna be selling meat that has contamination level of more than 20%. People are gonna get sick as a result of that. So type two is more serious, but let me tell you the consequences of type one. The consequences of type one, the business is gonna lose money because the inspector is gonna tell him that your meat is contaminated when it is not. So they're gonna ask him to take him off the shelf and destroy them. They will be losing money. No one will get sick because actually, even if they sell them, people will be fine, but they cannot sell them. So it's a loss of business here. I think type two is more serious because it does affect the health of people. So type two. I hope that my explanation makes uh, sense. I would live, but be honest with you guys, I would rather commit type one error rather than committing type two and sending people to the hospitals as a result of eating contaminated meat that I didn't know that it was contaminated or it was, but I could not you know, figure this out. So type two will be more serious. Uh, for you guys, when you perform hypothesis testing, you won't deal with this, but it's good to know that the, those types of errors uh, do uh, exist. All right. Uh, one more definition, and then I'm going to have you watch a video. Level of significance. Since type 1 error does happen, guys, you will be given a maximum allowance percentage to make type one error and it's denoted by alpha. So alpha is the maximum allowable probability of making a type one error. 
And alpha cannot exceed usually 10%. The most common levels of alpha guys are 10%, 5%, and 1%. So you will always be giving, you know, just a range to make a mistake, but your range here should not exceed 10% or 5 or 1%. I don't know, guys, if you can link the 10% to confidence interval. Do you know what confidence interval relates to the 10% here? Yes, I do. What confidence interval will tie to the 10%? Let's see. Not the 80. What do you need to add to 10 to make it 100? 90. And then for 5%, the 95%, or for 1%, the 99%. For 1%, the FDA requires any research medical study to be done at a 1% level of significance because they want, you know, the type one error chance to be as low as possible. They require that it is only no more than 1%. So you guys just get used to those values. And I think the most common one is alpha, which is 5%. It's, the, it's called the level of significance. This is the probability of making type one error. So they allow you to go at one, five, and uh, 10%. We're still in step number one. So guys, you learned how, <clears throat> you learned how uh, to state the null in the alternative hypothesis. And let me just give you a glance of step number two. You will be given information about the sample. You will be given the sample size. You will be given the sample standard deviation. You will be given the sample mean. So we're gonna be using the sample mean to test the claim about the population mean. And we will be using the sample proportion to test the claim about the population proportion. And we will be using the sample standard deviation to test the claim about the population standard deviation. But it's mainly these two guys. That will be 95% of the coverage on the mean and the proportion. Now, the next one, I'm gonna have you watch a video about something called the p-value. We will be using the p-value. It's a number between zero and one. It's a probability. You're gonna learn how to find the p-value and the calculator will help you find this p-value. This p-value will be compared with the level of significance, which we call alpha. And the decision whether to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis is gonna be based on this fact. If the p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null hypothesis. And if the p-value is more than alpha, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. So our focus, guys, in this chapter will be around how to find this p-value. And we'll be using all the information right here to find the p-value. But before I get deeper into the p-value concept, I would like you to watch uh, this five, three-minute video on uh, YouTube, so I'm gonna just uh, change, uh, stop sharing and share a new screen with you. So please give me your attention for uh, this video, just one second. All right. P-value. Whenever we use Excel or other computer packages to analyze data, one of the key outputs is the P-value or SIG. In formal terms, the P value is the probability that, if the null hypothesis were true, sampling variation would produce an estimate that is further away from the hypothesized value than our data estimate. In less formal terms, the p-value tells us how likely it is to get a result like this if the null hypothesis is true. We will now go through this step by step with an example. Helen sells chocolatees. Recently, she has received complaints that the chocolatees have fewer peanuts in them than they are supposed to. The packet says that each 200 gram packet of chocolatees contains 70 grams of peanuts or more. So you guys understand what the claim, the complaint. People are complaining that her chocolate nuries contain less than 70 gram of peanuts in them, but she claims on the back that it has 70 gram, uh, grams. So she needs, you know, just to 
study this claim. Helen can't open up all the packets to check, as then she wouldn't be able to sell any. So she decides to use a statistical test on a sample of the packets. The null hypothesis, often called H0, is the thing we are trying to provide evidence against. For Helen, the null hypothesis is that the chocolatees are as they should be. The mean or average weight of peanuts in the packet is 70 grams. The alternative hypothesis, called H1 or HA, is what we're trying to prove. The customers have complained that the weight of peanuts is less than what it should be. So the alternative hypothesis is that the average weight of peanuts is less than 70 grams. Helen decides to use a significance level of 0 0.05. You guys notice the significance level, this is 5%. We're gonna use it against the p-value. Once she finds the p-value, she's gonna compare it with alpha. If her p-value is less than alpha, she's gonna reject the null hypothesis. If her p-value is more than alpha, she's gonna fail to reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is lower than this, she will reject the null hypothesis. Having decided on her hypotheses and on the significance level, Helen takes a random sample of 20 packets of choconutties from her current stock of 400 packets. She melts down the choconutties and weighs the peanuts from each packet. If all of the values were lower than 70 grams, with a mean of 30 grams for instance, it would be quite obvious that the bars did not have the required number of peanuts. It is very unlikely that you will get 20 packets with a mean of 30 grams if the overall mean of all the packets in the population is 70 grams. Conversely, if all the values of the 20 packets were much higher than 70 grams, it would be obvious that there were enough peanuts and that there was nothing to complain about. However, in this case, the 20 packets contain the following weights of peanuts and the mean is 68.7 grams. This caused Helen to ask herself, does this provide enough evidence that the bars are short of peanuts, or could this result just be from luck? She asks her brother to use Excel to find the p-value for this data, comparing with a mean of 70 grams. The p-value is 0.18. Judging from the data that we have, there is an 18% chance of getting a mean as low as this or lower if there is nothing wrong with the bars. That is, if the null hypothesis is true and the mean weight of nuts is 70 grams or more. This p-value of 0.18 does not provide enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. In this case, Helen does not have evidence to say that the bars are short of peanuts. This is a relief. The smaller the p-value is, the less likely it is that the result we got was simply a result of luck. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing here. And come back to the other screen. There you go. Okay, guys, so let me just elaborate a little bit on uh, what we did and just explain this p-value thing uh, for you because everything you're going to be doing, guys, from now till we're done is finding this p-value. The calculator will, her brother used Excel, but you will be using the calculator to find the p-value, so you need to have a good grasp, you know, just of what the p-value is about. So I have... This right here. And I wanna explain, try to explain the p-value. But before I explain the p-value, let me just uh, give you some more definitions here. If your alternative hypothesis has a greater than sign, we call the hypothesis test a right tail test. Why right tail test? Because the alternative has a sign greater than 15, which goes to the right. Now, if you have something like this, guys. Uh, can you guess what we call the name of the test? It's a hypothesis test, but the, mere, the alternative is less than 15. This is called the left tail test. And then you could have something like that. Let me write it down. And let's see if one of you can guess the name. What do you think we call this one? So this is a left. The one that I have above is a right. What do you think this is called? Not equal to 15. Any suggestions? Uh, 
uh, a close two tail test, left and right, because not equal to 15, could be more than 15, could be uh, less than 15. If you ask me, what was your grade on quiz number five? I tell you it wasn't seven. So you can think it could be more than seven, it could be less than seven, but you know for sure it's not seven. This is called two-tail test. All right, now let me go back to this and uh, you can see what Helen did with the p-value. Once she figured out the p-value, her brother used Excel to find this p-value. Her p-value was 0 0.18, which is more than alpha. So she failed to reject the null hypothesis. So, and the null hypothesis was the fact that her uh, peanuts were 70 grams or more. So since she did not reject this fact, that means that was a sigh of relief for her because uh, the, the claim that people made was not validated. So, uh, so she was fine, you know, just with the p-value more being more than alpha. If the p-value was less than alpha, she would have been in trouble. That means the other claim was valid. So this is how important the p-value is. But you cannot make the p-value more or less. It's not up to you guys. It's based on the data that you have. You use the data to find the p-value. If the p-value is less than alpha, you reject HO. And if the p-value is more than alpha, you fail to reject HO. And I'm gonna sketch the p-value for you guys and show you what the p-value is. So this is a typical problem that we're gonna start with in section 7.2. Let's say this is HO, this is HA. I kinda like the number 15, I keep putting this one. And let's say the claim is there. And let's say, guys, you are given this information. You are given X bar. You are given sigma population standard deviation. You are given N. And alpha is at 5%. And let me show you how to find uh, the p-value. First of all, we need to change X bar to a z-score, just like we did in chapter 5. We have this formula, guys, in chapter 5, to change an X to a z-score. But if it is an X bar, guys, we decided that when we use X bar in section 5.4, we do sigma over the square root of N. So this is our formula for Z. So if I wanna change this one to a Z score, this is what we call it a test statistic. That's step number two. And your calculator will be able to do it. So you don't need to do any work by, by hand at all. But in order for me to explain it, I have to show the work by hand. So this is 15.45 minus. The mean, I told you guys, we have to assume that the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. What is the value in the null hypothesis is 15, so we put 15 there. Divided by sigma, 0 0.65, divided by square root of n, square root of 70. Okay, let's do this. 15.45 minus 15 is 0 0.45, divided by Open parentheses, I'm gonna show you how to enter this into the calculator, square root of 70. So here's my calculator, guys, watch. Uh, 0 0.45 divided by open parentheses, 0 0.65 divided by square root of 17, Okay, and I got 2.85. So we converted X bar to a test statistic Z, Z score, which is called the test statistic in this chapter. Now let me tell you what the P value is, guys. You guys agree with me this is a right tail test because mu is greater than 15. So you come to Z equal 2.5 and put it on the number line on the normal curve. Z equal 2.85 right here. Because it is a right tail test, we have to go to the right. So the p-value, guys, is the area to the right of Z equals 2.85. If you have a less than, then Z, the p-value will be the area to the left of z equal to, but you wouldn't get a positive number, guys. You would have gotten a negative number. So it will be an area to the left. So this is your p-value. 
And I think, guys, on Monday, you had a lot of questions to find the area to the right of Z equal 2.85, something like that. How do I do this? It's normal CDF. And can someone help me with the four arguments here to find this area? What's the lower bound? 2.85. What's the upper bound? The sky is the limit. And then 0, 1. Okay, let me do this and show you what the p-value is. So the p-value is the probability of having a z-score as as high as 2.85 or more, or more extreme. What is the probability of getting a z-score that high? So let's see. Second and distribute, normal CDF, 2.85, comma, 1,000 or 1 million, whatever, 0, comma, 1. And here is my p-value, 0 0.0022. Watch, guys. Okay. What is alpha in this exercise? Alpha is 0 0.05. Okay, if I put 0 0.05 here, guys, which sign would you select? Greater than or less than? Is the p-value more than 0 0.05 or less than 0 0.05? Do you guys agree with me it is less, 0 0.002? Okay, so this is bad. Well, if it is less, then you reject H show. So the conclusion, guys, is if p-value is less than alpha, reject H show. If p-value more than alpha, fail to reject H show. In our case, we rejected HO. And let me show you how do you make a conclusion about the claim. Somebody is claiming that the mean is more than 15, guys. You rejected this guy here. You concluded that HO is bad. That means HA is good. That means the claim is good. Then you support the claim. This is how we're going to do the hypothesis testing. So that's to give you a glance at the p-value. Now guys, all the work I did, you could have simplified this by using one simple test here. And watch and see how that test works. I could have gone to stat, tests, just like in chapter six, when sigma is known, we use Z interval here, we use Z test because sigma is known. And watch guys. It's asking you to input the value that you see in the null hypothesis. What I see in the null hypothesis is the number 15, so I just put 15. It's asking you to put the value of sigma. What is sigma in this exercise, guys? As you can see, it's 0 0.65. Watch. Then it's asking you to input x bar, which is 15.45. Then it's asking you to put the sample size and what did I choose for a sample size, 17. And then this is the last step before I hit calculate and I need your help with it. This last step is asking you to select the alternative sign, the sign in the alternative hypothesis. So which sign do I select guys, first, second or third? Again, it is the sign in the alternative hypothesis. Let me see what students say here. Third one, I agree. It's a greater than, guys. Yes. So this is how you select it. It's a blinking. So you just go and then press enter and watch, guys. Calculate. I'm going to show you what the draw does as well. Oh, Z equals 2.85. Let's see. Did I get 2.85 here? There you go. You see all that work? It's done with the calculator. P-value, remember what the P-value was, guys. 0 0.0022, watch here. If you round this to uh, four decimal places, what do you get? 0 0.0022. So your calculator is gonna give you the step number two, which is test statistic. 
Step number three, which is the p-value, but you guys, the calculator does not tell you if you should reject HO or fail to reject HO. You need to know that. If your p-value, it's as simple as remembering this. Less than alpha, you reject HO. If your p-value is more than alpha, you fail to reject HO. Now, would you, probably you'd ask me, are we always given alpha definitely? If alpha is not given, guys, a statistician recommend to use 5% if it's not given. But it will be given in all problems. So this is how uh, you find the p-value using your calculator. Let me do it with a draw now. Just the same example, but I'm just instead of hitting calculate, I'm going to hit the draw. And so I'll show you something here. Watch. It gives you the Z, which is 2.85, and it shades the p-value. But because the p-value is almost 0%, you don't see any shading right here, guys. If this was like, you know, a 5 or 6%, you would have seen something. But it's less than 1%. It doesn't show anything. It would have shown uh, uh, something in there. So you could use this, a draw or hit calculate. You would get step, uh, step number two and step number three. All right, any questions here? This, right tail test, left tail test, two tail test, so just put them in the handout, I'll give you examples. So this is an example of a right tail test. I'll change the 15. I'll make it 100. And you sketch it like that. That's Z, and uh, it will be something like this, guys. This is the p-value. P-value will be on the right. Let me show you the left tail test. It will be something like this. This is the p-value. And two tail tests, something like that. And I want a student to tell me where would the p-value be. There you go, okay, something like that. Any ideas, guys, where the p-value would be since I have a two-tail test? Not in the center. It has to be in the tails. The p-value is an extreme probability. It goes to the extreme beyond the test statistic. So that's a hint. You see, that goes beyond the test statistic to the right. That goes beyond the test statistic to the left. What do you think it's going to happen for two tail test? Both ends, exactly. It's going to be a negative Z here. Whatever Z you get, you're going to have two values and then a positive Z. So that will be half of the P value here. And the other half will be right there. But when you use calculator, guys, it will give you the p-value. You don't have to worry about it. But this is how you see it with the uh, uh, sketch. Okay. Uh, so this is two-tail test. How do you know this is a two-tail test from this sign? You don't look at the null, guys. You look at this sign. This is not equal. That means a two-tail test. And why this is important, as you told, I told you, when you use your calculator, cannot because this is where students make mistakes they go to stat tests z test and then here they don't do the right thing well if it is a greater than you have to put a greater than if it is a less than you have to put a less than if it is not equal for example if you are doing this exercise guys you have to change this and make it not equal to 100 
let's let me try it for example with this just make up some data and show you how that works let's say mu zero is 100 i'm gonna leave sigma the same let's say this is 100 175 let's say n is 27 i would like to show you the two tails guys watch and then i'll show you a draw so this is the test statistic. This is the, you see how small the p-value is? It's very small. If I do a draw, it's not gonna show me uh, anything. A draw will not show anything because the p-value is so small. There you go. You see what it says? The p-value is zero. That means it's less than alpha. The larger your z-score, guys, the further you are away from the mean, the smaller the p-value. So when your z-score is high, that means your p-value is low. And I'm going to show you this acronym. You can try to memorize this one. P-value low, HO must go. When you have a low p-value, you reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. Just a couple more things and... Uh, we'll just do uh, this one and we'll be done, guys. Just bear with me a few more minutes and uh, I'm almost there. Okay, so probably I wouldn't need uh, yeah, I didn't even manage to finish that much with the other group. So just this exercise and we'll be done. For each claim, state HO and HA, then determine whether the hypothesis test is a left tail test, right tail test, or two tail test. Sketch a normal sample and distribution and share the, share the area of the p-value. So let me just do this and put up this up. A school publicizes that the proportion of its students who are involved in at least extracurricular activities is 61%. So we did that earlier, guys. So P is 61%, P is not 61%, and the claim is right here. Okay, he wants us to shade the p-value. Here you go. This is a two-tailed test, guys. You do this, you put a zero here in the center, and you guys agree with me that the p-value is gonna be shaded on both sides. Now, what is this value right here? I don't know, he has to give me some more information to figure this out, but that's how it is. This is two tails. Do you guys agree with uh, number one? Okay, number two. A car dealership announced that the mean time for oil change is less than 15 minutes. Less, see, I wrote the less than in the alternative because this sign has to be in the alternative. So this one will be greater than 15 minutes and this is your claim. And can someone tell me where the p-value is going to be, guys? Right or left? Any suggestion? Would I shade on the right or on the left? On the left, I agree. Left. That's the p-value. The smaller the p-value, the more likely to reject HO. Number three. A company is uh, advertised that the mean life of its furnaces is more than 18 years. More than 18, that's the claim. You can see, I made sure to, to, to do all cases, guys. And this is gonna be like this. And the p-value is going to be on the right. For you guys, the calculator just gives you the p-value. You compare it with alpha. And finally, you compare the p-value of alpha. If p-value is less than or equal, you'll never get the equal, guys. So that's why I put less than and greater than. Then reject HO. 
if p value is more than alpha, then fail to reject the HO. Uh, that would be it for today.